Please note that though this is a spoiler-free review of the subject, I do spoil the series and or franchise leading up to this particular entry. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam-pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Suicide Squad in 3D, briefly going over the 3D. It's pretty good, it adds some depth, and there are several times where things will fly at the screen. Katana chops the head off one of the supernatural goons, and the like skull, I guess, flies at you. The incubus whips the the I don't know, tendrils or whatever at you at least once. So all in all, I would say if you're going to watch it anyway, I would spring for the 3D. The origin story of Suicide Squad, because if there's one thing comic book movies need, it's more origin stories. When when Man of Steel arrived, the the Man of Steel rather, it really it hit pretty hard. It really redefined how people looked at you know the the world they thought they knew. But enough about the movie. Yes, as such, the the which I understand is apparently in at least some versions the 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 reason for it in the comics as well. The the you know people saw Superman and were like, okay, this you know what the, this thing with meta humans. What's you know sh can can we how we didn't. Can we trust them? And yeah, so the the idea for creating a, a squad that can deal with meta human threats is created. Apparently Superman was like a beacon and in this in, in the trailers it kinda sounds like his arrival. In this it kinda sorta sound like it was his death, but that creates even more problems. The, what I'm what I'm getting at is the bat flag is who put almost all of these in jail. It, this is not a spoiler. One of them was actually put in jail by the Flash, who does absolutely nothing. He appears and that's it. I don't know why they even bothered, but anyway. So you know at if we go by, okay, Superman's arrival caused this, that must mean that Bat Batfleck put these in prison in, you know, at least over the course of the 18 months between Man of Steel and Dawn of Justice. But then if this is after, I'm not sure how, excuse me, how long after it is, excuse me, and since, you know, the Justice League have still not been formed, when this movie takes place, yeah, I don't know. Even, you know, it, it's even it's an even bigger problem if, if the metahumans only really showed their faces after Superman died, and then either this is set somewhat far ahead, or Batman was incredibly fast about catching all of these people. But yes, the the. In in ha having a base in Bellary, not Arkham Asylum, which is, though, briefly seen in this, not quite as long as in the Nolan trilogy, 
where it's also kind of blink and you'll miss it. And also not Blackgate Penitentiary. Basically, the you know the concept here is Dirty Dozen with meta humans. And the the you know the idea is that they you know this task force X as they're also called the suicide squad can be used to refer to others but yeah these are specifically the t you know task force X and yeah you know it's a wor it's a way for them to work off their sentences don't beg your pardon work it off and they are sent into Midway City to attack to to deal with what they are told is a terrorist attack. And the in in one of the gunships that they also use in the comic, led by Rick Flag, and each of them having a kill switch in their neck, which will blow their head off. And this is actually shown to us. It's not just exposited about or threatened with, we actually see someone get their head blown off quite early even so yeah and yeah the the from there on out we're following them trying to deal with the the problem the the joker in this basically just wants harley back and he's kind of a wild card and the squad will encounter him at least once over the course of it and I, I do have to imagine that, you know, in part it's passion that he wants Harley back. He's probably also bored because clearly Batfleck is incredibly easily manipulated. We saw that with how easily the Piddler handled him. And, you know, Batfleck, maybe the reason he caught them so quickly was that he was just reinvigorated by no longer having to deal with Zod's day. That guy could melt your face off with his laser beam eyes. And the... You know, it's occurred to me that Man of Steel was the DCEU story nobody really wanted, so they spent a lot of, you know, Dawn of Justice trying to tell us, don't worry, we'll get to at least one story you do care about. I can only imagine this is trolling. It's so clearly not the case that I'm going to go ahead and say it in this. I read somewhere that, I, th I think in IMDb trivia, that I, I, I'm going to say it's Baron, Baron Holtz. I'm going to go with Ike. Ike's character was probably the villain. No, that's, that's not the case. I, I must be trolling, but yeah, for a while, it looked like Joker was going to be, you know, I don't know, I, I suppose not everyone took, necessarily took that from the trails, but I did, that he was going to be the villain, and I couldn't quite figure out how could that mean that they would need the Suicide Squad, the, you know, why not just send in, you know, it's, is Gotham, Gotham Police Department that corrupt? You know, but then as the trails went on, it became clear that there were going to be actual supernatural forces of evil in play here. And, yeah, it's not really... It's revealed very early on, and it's in the trailers, and it's really, if, you know, if I, didn't, if I don't say this, you just don't know who the villain is, and I, it, it's not a, a big twist or anything. Basically, it's Enchantress, Enchantress and her brother Incubus that are the villains, and I I was wondering if it was really, you know, when the moment you send the squad out, there's some chance that they're going to kill someone innocent. And in this, they're, they're actually being dropped into 
the city. So, you know, might there be innocents that come out? And basically, I've, I've seen it called avocado men. I really like that, so I'm going to go with that. We learn pretty early on that the uh, avocado men, the, you know, this seemingly endless supply of goons that, you know, Incubus and Enchantress and I keep mispronouncing June Moon's Alter Ego and Incubus. I'm gonna mainly go with Incubus. Scratch that. June Moon's Alter Ego and Incubus have transformed the humans in because they, you know, again, this is in one of the trailers, not really a spoiler. One of the first things Incubus does is slice a subway train, you know, right down the middle, separate le the, the left and right half of it as it speeds towards him. They're right in the middle of the city. There are a ton of people around. And yeah, they all get turned into, you know, they, you know, possibly not everyone, but a ton of these people, dozens, maybe a hundred or more, are turned into avocado men. And I think that that walks a lot because we're not seeing the squad kill human beings. They're not quite that anymore. But it's not like these weren't human beings before. So it it does have that dark edge to it you know every time as much as it's cool to see them you know kill these it it actually does yeah there is that that dark side to it that these used to be human beings so yeah and uh, you know in in the comics the squad do kill quite a few people, but it does tend to be evil people, and, you know, the climax involves this big, you know, the, the great big swirl in the sky, and that again made me think, that really doesn't seem like Joker, it's, it's too dystopian, it's too apocalyptic, and, you know, doesn't really have the, the kind of comedic tragedy, color, and black humor that he, you know, has the the kind of poetic we wouldn't call the justice but yeah and yeah it would basically be in in the comics they, there does tend to be meta humans on the other side of the you know that that the squad have to fight or an army of some sort and Rewatching the Nolan trilogy, I realized the the villains, especially in two and three, where they really have an opportunity to the Batman villains blow up a lot of stuff, especially in three. But yeah, in this they don't really have a lot of opportunity to. That's probably the only reason they don't get to. diving headfirst into notes. The movie is an hour and 55 minutes not counting the end credits and you have no reason whatsoever to sit through the full end credits unless you too want to see for yourself that Zack Snyder's production company I I haven't looked this up yet, but I, I would be very surprised if he isn't involved with this, is actually called... One second. Atlas Entertainment, as in Ayn Rand. Yeah, he's... If, if he doesn't get to do the, that, that actual adaptation of Ayn Rand novel, he's at least going to name his, and it literally, it has Atlas there carrying the, the, yeah, on his back. 
there is no post credit scene. There is a mid credit scene. It's okay, but you know you're not gonna spend a lot of time. It's it's maybe two or three minutes into the credits, and it's before the credits become just the the series of you know white text on black screen. You know it's when there's still excuse me color and life and animation excuse me surrounding the credits because of the the many cuts Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship has very little teeth to it and I you know I didn't know how much it was going to have but you know look just read the IMDb trivia spoilers yeah it it had a decent set of teeth to it before in the climax there's at least one bit that has excessive slow motion but otherwise I feel like the movie did a decent enough job of that and the movie is very much watered down David Iyer and I will go into the different aspects of that over the course of the video and I a lot of critics have said that they just it just didn't quite pull them in it didn't give them a reason to care and it didn't really yeah it just and yeah I mean this is probably the DCEU movie I was looking most forward to not that they're, you know, I, I do still think Wonder Woman, you know, given the director and the recent trailer, looks quite good. But, yeah, of, of like, the major ones announced, you know, at the time I make this video, yeah, this was the one that I figured would probably be the most fun and just... I'm not saying that because the Zack Snyder movies are no longer fun, but just, yeah, it looked like it was going to have some personality and such, and it does, but it's just not quite, yeah, and, and, it's, it's the only David Iyer movie where it just, it didn't quite have me every second of the way, and it was just yeah I I I went in and and this is not I wasn't like hugely disappointed this is not me being bitter it just it didn't quite grab me the same way it didn't quite have the yeah and and that really is too bad but it, it's nowhere near as bad as some are saying, but, yeah. As pretty much expected, the movie basically opens with a roll call. You know, it's like, okay, there, here's this character, here's a brief background, you know, probably having some kind of action where they get to do the thing that we know that they're really good at, and... Amanda Waller explaining who they are and move on to the next character. And some of that is quite fun. The the you know it, it really allows the movie to have some fun with each of these characters and just give you know the the various introductions tend to be quite good and to showcase their identity fairly well. I realized that this might be... It's, it's made clear very early on that Harley sees things that may very well not be quite real or that she's, she's clearly very disturbed. When she's arrested, Batfleck kisses her. I really, really hope that that's just like something she imagines because that's that's pretty messed up. And and 
she's not it's not entirely clear if she's like quite awake or conscious at the time so yeah just when he thought he couldn't get any more messed up I I wasn't sure I saw this right in the trailers but June Moon and Rick Flagg are together and as such Rick Flagg you know Amanda Waller has something on everybody the the you know if, if Amanda Waller gets Christmas presents it's because she has photos of Santa you know doing something he shouldn't possibly involving one of the naughty girls that is the oldest joke anyway so she has something on Rick Flag as well and it is that he is with June Moon that's that's not a secret really but there's you know she can threaten June Moon because of June Moon's alter ego and that's yeah that's leverage on Rick and it was very much you know like it's it's kind of the the love at first sight kind of thing but so so that's a little cheesy that you know okay if I put these two people if I put two attractive people in the same general area they will rub their naughty bits against each other to be fair Cara de Levine is attractive even when partially covered in mud. As part of this being cut down by a lot is characters will move extremely swiftly you know as in in a scene like once they've done what they were gonna do in the scene and they're leaving the the area they'll basically seem to almost teleport and it's kind of like you know when you don't have to show in real time the character move from point A to point B but it's still a little jarring in this among the many many songs this uses is Kanye's, I want to say, Black Skinhead is what it's called. Excuse me, I'm going to get into the, the whole music thing, but I do think it's a little unfortunate that this uses that same song when it was in both the movie, really well used, and prominent in the trailers of Neighbors 2, which used it really, really well. I think I already just said that, but... I'm, I'm not sure I'd say this uses it as well. And and certainly it you know it makes you think of this other movie and yeah, it's a it's a little unfortunate. And I really doubt that they couldn't when when they edited this, they knew that that song was in Neighbors 2. So, yeah. When when Joker like smiles and such he doesn't always smile with the full teeth and the full teeth is kind of where one of the problems I'll, I'll get more into that when he smiles and he doesn't show the teeth that's actually fairly disturbing and and more disturbing than when when he does show the teeth yeah This kind of makes a thing out of people holding their their like you know smartphone or some of the time it might be a a iPad up against the 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 glass that separates the person holding the iPad from the person they want to communicate with and usually threaten 
and showing some some footage of something that gives them leverage over the other person. Others have noted this. Incubus does look a little too much like the Destroyer in Thor 1. It's not like completely the same, but just, you know, it, a tall guy, slightly bigger than, at least slightly bigger than human, and there's this kind of orangey glow coming from within, between the various, like, plates almost that make up his body. The, it's it's said very early on that part of the the thing that they're sitting into midway to do is to rescue this this high value target or HVT. The, mo the moment they said HVT, Deadshot is like, okay, for those of us who don't speak, good guy. What does that mean? The moment I, you know, because once again I've played Splinter Cell Blacklist entirely too much and in that game you get points for capturing HVTs and she Amanda Waller mentioned you know explains this to him and she literally says HVT1 is the only one you can't kill she doesn't say if you see any that aren't avocado pen you know try to wound or maybe that no she says that's the only character that you can't that's the only person you can't kill. I was surprised by how often this uses the S word, but you know, you can do that in PG-13 movies today. And I want to say they also use their 1F bomb, but there's definitely a lot of S words, and it's, you know, it, it works fine. It's not, like, excessive, I don't think. The, the avocado men, you see one person be turned into one of the avocado men, and I get why they did this. It, it kind of, it looks pretty good, but you see Jumun's alter ego do it with just one person, and it's like, does she have to do that for every single one? Because we've seen a lot of them. And it's like, and I just feel like they should just have had like a crowd and then have her do some magic that then, you know, manifests on each. And at first you just barely, you, you see that something starts to happen to them. And then you see the last person like look around and panic and then look like, you know, t turn and face the camera. Not look at the camera, but just face the camera and then you see him transform the way you see him transform here because as it is it just makes you think did she really stand there and do that one by one and I know this is a thing this is a trope but and maybe it's part of that it didn't completely grab me and that's something I may not have said there's a lot of action in this and it just wasn't quite as exciting and it's not because it's not well done yeah but as with a lot of other action movies the when the avocado men attack because there's like there's a a group of seals with the the suicide squad they don't actually get to spend a lot of time alone really which is kind of what you wanted to see but yeah I, I guess I basically get it, but the the yeah, at, you you don't really the avocado men tend to attack in a way that works for the squad and sometimes even the seals. Although you know there are times where it becomes like really close calls and such, but 
yeah, you know, like a ton will run at the seals and dead squad because they'll dead dead shot because they'll shoot them, and then you know they'll come kind of one at a time at someone like Harley because she likes to bash them in with the baseball bat and things like that, and yeah, it's just. There's one point when Amanda Waller, she, there are these people that have worked for her, and she basically, she kind of, she doesn't need them anymore, and she generally grabs a gun and she shoots them one by one. It's, yeah, she really is. <laughs> yeah. Diablo, you don't particularly see this in the trailers, and it might have been that they thought it was a little too, they didn't want to risk people finding this a little too goofy, and frankly it does end up a little goofy. Diablo many times uses his flames to basically like create a small figure or write something like when when they first like try to recruit him they basically just put you know he he turns excuse me he turns them down and you know once he's 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 just said that he doesn't want but then he writes right in front of him goodbye and it's just yeah, and there's this other point where he creates like this little figure, this, it, this this kind of dancing, seductive woman kind of figure, and it's just, yeah, I don't know, it's it's just a little a little goofy. And I suppose that covers the bat. Returning to the fact that they fly in. I'm not certain where Midway is in relation to Gotham and Metropolis, but if it's as close to the two of them as they are to each other, I just I wonder if it might have been easier and safer to try to sail in. I, we we know f for sure that there's water between Gotham and Metropolis. What happened to that? Dried up. And the movie did manage to have the the squad kill more than Batfleck did in Dawn of Justice. That was pretty impressive. To be fair, there are more people on the squad. He's he's just one man. And, you know, David Goyer has said, oh, you can't do, you know, something like Superman seriously today. No, no, no. 
you can't do that. You know, others are doing that quite, are, are taking comic properties and doing them seriously. Now, others have already mentioned, if Batfleck is so willing, even eager to kill regular criminals, why did he not kill the, the you know, the metahumans that in this join the Suicide Squad? Now, I... Before this, David Iyer did a movie about Americans fighting Nazis, and you know, then he moved on because World War II ended. I mean, excuse me, sir. And you know, in that, they, you know, they're they're the Americans are stuck with these tanks that are very light on armor and really easy to get to blow up. You know, it, it took 50,000 of these American tanks to take out just 1,500 of the, I want to say, Tiger tanks that the Germans used. You know, you have all these Americans fighting this you know these these much better German tanks, and that's the tanks they get. The to, to briefly the the 3D. I don't think this was a post conversion. It feels like several. You know, I I already mentioned the the stuff that'll fly at the screen. It feels like those sequences were very much planned for the the 3D. And they're and they're not like just brief little or you know no these are you know I don't know if it was Iyer or like the cinematographer or who exactly but someone working on it wanted it to end up in 3D I I would say it's it's most likely I appreciate that none of these characters really had like a theme song very specific to them that would play very distractingly in the movie. You know, David Iyer does great scores, you know, rap, other urban music, really cool music, and, you know, there, there are times when this is actually as light and fun as the, the trailers make it seem with, you know, modern rap and pop, some, some of the pop from the 70s. And it does indeed play full with lyrics at times. You know, it doesn't play the full song. You know, at, at least not all of the, the time. But, you know, it does also use score. But, yeah, if you look up the soundtrack on Wikipedia, yeah, a, a few of those are only played over the end credits. But... Most of them are actually in the movie. And, you know, others have pointed out that it can at times feel like, you know, just one long music video, which does fit with this, you know, kind of, with, with Zack Snyder mostly being the person holding the keys to the DCEU. You know, with, with each of these, you have to wonder, does it help or hurt the DCEU? And I think, overall, this helps. I don't know if... You know, obviously, it's nowhere near as bad as Dawn of Justice. I, I don't know if I'll see a movie as bad as that, you know, for the next long time. Especially, again, like I... Wrote in annotations, you know, as far as big budget movies and mainstream movies and such, it just wasn't that confusing. And yeah, but I went into that already in that video. 
so obviously it's you know it's not that anywhere near that bad is it as good or better than man of steel it's less focused which says a lot than man of steel you might say that it at times does a better job of I just briefly I, I forget if I've ever said but yeah overall it I would say it helps the DCEU I don't think anyone's going to watch this and say okay forget it I'm not giving the DCEU any more chance if if you were still with it if you were willing to give it more chances after the Dawn of Justice this is not going to be the deal breaker but yeah and there are times where this manages to better set up and then explore a kind of conflict between you know the the major characters how do they do do they think they can make a difference and do they want to and that kind of thing you know it, it sets them up better and explores them better and actually ends up also giving a kind of closure on that but then it's also kind of some of that is not the most satisfying in in the way that they do resolve it I suppose overall this and Man of Steel are roughly equally good. They have different strengths, but yeah, yeah, I think that's where it lands. Now, as research for this, and also because I enjoyed doing so before, I have played Arkham Asylum three times, Arkham City two times, and you know specifically in the the time leading up to this you know I didn't I didn't just play those purely for this and it wasn't quite that recently I think it's a month or two back but specifically for this I rewatched Man of Steel 300 because if I have an excuse to watch 300 I will watch 300 the Nolan trilogy Every movie that David Iyer has rewatched, except for Sabotage, I will get to it. And I wasn't able to get my hands on the library copy of End of Watch. Just, but I have watched it. I, I suppose I've only watched it the one time, but I'll definitely be watching it again. And I also rewatched Training Day, and that is basically I, I have watched SWAT and I might watch that again the, the library didn't have that but those are basically it for what I've watched that he's written that he didn't also direct and I read the comic books A Death in the Family and the Suicide Squad comics from the Ashes Basilisk Rising, Death is for Suckers, Discipline and Punish, and Walled In. Quite good comics. And anything I say in these videos that where I say that's how it is in the comics, those are the books that I'm referring to. You know, those Suicide Squad. Mostly those Suicide Squad. In general, those are the comics that I'm referring to. I haven't read any other Suicide Squad, and I will admit I had not read Suicide Squad before this movie. I, I I really only knew what I know about the characters from the two Arkham games, the first two Arkham games. I did not read Under the Hood since Zack Snyder apparently debunked that, the, the theory that that one was part of the... Yeah, that, you know, for those who haven't read that, I'm not going to give away for those who have read, you probably know what I'm talking about.
the I'm gonna go into a critic's quotes here and the when I noted it, it might have changed since then. The Rotten Tomatoes Critics Consensus, I wanna say it's called, was that the movie has a talented cast and a little more humor than the other DCU, but overall is disappointing because of a muddled plot thin characters and choppy directing and I suppose that is more or less the the case I would say that I'd say there there's more than a little more humor there's a lot more humor in this than in Dawn of Justice and don't get me wrong I'm not one of the people who the who thinks that there was no humor at all in it's more that the humor was kind of smothered by the rest of the film. And I'm also not one of the people who thinks that that Dawn of Justice was bad because it was really dark. Again, I did videos on that. I'm not going to go into it here. But, yeah, there's, there's a lot more humor here. Just some of it is quite dark and the like. But that's also something this, you know, some, some of the humor you know, we know, and it's also very clear, was added in reshoots. But there was already some humor, and with all the reshoots, I don't know what some of the people, how, how they reached this conclusion, but this is not a light film. It's, it's lighter than other David Iyer, but in, in other parts, this has this has a a body count greater than you know I haven't watched all of them but the the ones I've just listed all of those combined this has a greater death toll and again it's like the movie could have said no no, no June Moon's alter ego summoned these and and there's you know you don't have to watch. they're these soulless creatures no, no no these used to be human beings you know like they 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 do that that's a human being. and and when they say that it used to be human you know we have to be realistic they're gonna kill us if we don't kill them and we don't know that there's any way we can turn them back so for now we just have to kill them it has a lot of darkness to it, and it's, I don't, I don't think that, which, you know, is also, it does more or less fit in with the DCEU. You know, there's, there's still, in, in some ways, it is darker than Dawn of Justice, but the, yeah, I, I, it's true that there are some light moments, but it's still a very dark film, and it definitely is a David Iyer film. It doesn't feel like he just did someone else's movie and didn't... No, no, no. He, he did bring his style. Like I said earlier, it's just dil diluted, but again, I'll get more into details later on. Some have noted that you know, the, the movie's criticized for pacing issues, for a kind of generic and predictable second half, a boring villain, which, you know, some of that is basically true of Deadpool as well, but that one was much more positively received by critics. I do think that on the whole that movie does succeed better. I. I'm not one of the people who think that Deadpool is the second coming of comic book movies. It's it's a fun enough comic book movie. I don't think it's enough of a parody to like completely upend and make you look at the movies in a completely it's it's not yeah. I I don't really have a problem with Deadpool. I just like I said I don't think it's the best thing ever. And I do think it really, it, it, 
it takes away a lot of the edge and fun of the character by putting him in such a mainstream movie and yeah stripping away a lot of the fun of the character which is he's not very mainstream but yeah I I don't think that the movie you know even for the some of those issues being part of the problem in both that is a better movie than this one but at the same time I also really don't think that this deserves anywhere near excuse me as, as low a tomato rating as it has right now but you know there you go that's it's it's that most critics you know yeah don't think highly of it you know that's that's basically it's it's not that it's not necessarily that the majority of critics think that it deserves I think last I looked it was like 26 percent or something it's not it doesn't say that most critics think it should have 26 it just means that that may, you know I guess that means basically 74 percent of critics didn't like it it and that just keeps taking away from you know and I basically understand that I, I do think it's a little too bad that it counts it like that since a lot of these critics are saying some of the same things but you know that's yeah you know it's it's not a perfect site and it does it does reflect that critics really didn't like it much but yeah and I, I do think it, it was interesting that different critics said that you know some said that the movie becomes completely formulaic in the second half and and just completely follows the the rules set by the movies whereas other critics say that the movie specifically doesn't follow any rules and doesn't follow a formula and in both cases the the critics thought that was a problem and i can i can see both points of view i would say especially in the the second half it is pretty formulaic. It's it's a lot more predictable than other Iyer films. But then at the same time, it's not completely, you know, you don't see absolutely everything coming. And it is, you know, it should be noted of all of David Iyer's films, this is the one that actually where there was like real studio pressure to like this has to fit into a box that we've already built you know the, the this is the only time that it, this is the first movie he's made that's part of a franchise and one that has already had two movies in it before you know like i i still don't really know if if letty in Training Day and Lady in Harsh Times are the same person because they're played by the same actress and their the names are spelled the exact same way, but yeah. The the other than that, you know, there's really no he, he uses some of the same actors, and there are actors in Training Day that David Iyer uses in what he directs, you know, so and they're clearly playing different characters so no he doesn't usually connect different movies his his stories are very much this is what happens this this particular time you know things similar to it probably happen in the the same world that this movie inhabits but it's not that each leads into one of the or or the like when you know, if that was what he wanted to do, he basically could, because before Fury, it was mostly just, you know, L.A., South Central, you know, the bad neighborhoods with kind of gang activity, although, you know, for, he, he's, the, the guy who makes movies about, you know, like the, the kind of gang environment, but he hasn't actually, he hasn't directed a movie. And I'm not sure he's written one either, where it's actually like 
this is a gang and this is you know there there are characters who aren't gangs and his his characters maybe move through these areas and interact with gangs and such but he hasn't had a protagonist who is a gang member in you know anyway the others have pointed out that it can be kind of difficult to follow and yeah and and I would say that for for newcomers you can watch it without having watched Man of Steel or Dawn of Justice and you can watch it without having read any of the comics but yeah some of the characters you're gonna have a little bit of a hard time you know completely keeping up with okay what what exactly is going on with them and yeah and so I'm pointing out it's, it's gleefully nihilistic very much the case a lot of the the Joker stuff is I I don't I didn't see a lot of stuff in the trailers that just wasn't at all I at the very least I could tell okay so this is the scene where it would have gone and the scene plays out more or less the same way as it you know would have if that bit was there but apparently there were entire scenes basically or yeah there, there was a lot of material that just isn't in the movie and I really do feel like that's too bad. It's not Amazing Spider-Man 2 levels of kind of really deceptive trailers, but yeah, some of the stuff that you like in the trailer isn't actually in the movie. And in general, there are things that are at the very least cut down in the movie from the trailers where it's like, oh, this part that I see in the movie, you know, I in, in the trailer I saw the part leading up to it, but yeah. Others have noted there are too many flashbacks. That's definitely the case. Apparently, one one critic counted it to eight or more. I didn't personally count since the other person did. That's quite possible, yeah. And is you know they explain too much or too little. And it's You know, it's the the movie is, you know, really really eager to flash attitude and to praise itself for being edgy when it isn't as edgy as it thinks it is. Quite true. The you know, it it doesn't know what to do with the you know the members of the suicide squad and there are plot points that are a little difficult to understand and yeah we're not really given any reason to care about the people the characters herein and the movie was definitely you know, in in when they edited it, it was really very clear. Like there was stuff cut. There were other things that were you know things were there. There are things that are in the movie, but they were changed a lot from how they originally were. And I really do think it doesn't it doesn't feel like a lot has been added. Like the the jokes that they put in are short little bits not yeah and I mean like I said the, the movies just under two hours if a lot of if a lot more stuff was in the movie I don't know I you know they they could cut other stuff but then that would also leave things confused I, I don't think it it doesn't have a lot that 
you could cut and lose nothing. And the the you know we're supposed to kind of enjoy that these characters are just you know evil and enjoy doing these all things, but then you know they're given these sad soulful kind of you know maudlin backstories that you know they're they're just misunderstood and that kind of thing and yeah that does take away from it some say it steals from other movies plots I didn't personally notice that too much I I don't know maybe I just think of those more as you know movie tropes other than but rather than them belonging to specific movies but I could be wrong some say that the the casting isn't as great as I, I don't really feel like the, the, some of the characters were changed to fit the actor playing it but I don't think that the there was ever really any any casting choice that I thought was just completely wrong for the way it is in the movie and definitely the the comics do have more compelling stories than this and it you know it's it's very very Hollywood and I don't know how early along well no I mean yeah they can't have changed that much it was it was quite Hollywood before Dawn of Justice got so much flack which you know there are a lot of things with that movie that you know I can't claim excuse me I can't claim that it's too Hollywood that's yeah but they yeah they must have already known that they were going to make this so Hollywoody but yeah you know the at times that almost makes it feel like you know a, a lesser Marvel movie but the Marvel, Marvel movies at times can be fairly straightforward in, in like overall you know I love the Marvel movies but I'm not going to claim they're all perfect but Man of Steel does also have some very Hollywood moments but yeah this this is the most straightforward of the the three DCU movies so far and the you know the the you know Will Smith and Marco Robbie are some of the best you know best performances and yeah so, at least one critic said that the the lines worked well in the trailers but don't make sense in context I don't really I I don't think I can think of any examples of that and it it is very much Harley's movie and, and that's also the case in the comics you know she she has so much personality she kind of steals the show and you know Marco Robbie is really spot on and the action and humor are great some said that the stakes should feel higher I mean the stakes are actually really high and I suppose you don't feel that as much as you should and th yeah that is a problem the the stakes are very high but you don't really feel it you don't care as much as you definitely should considering how high they are one not not a critic but a you know a, a regular person a, a mere mortal civilian on Rotten Tomatoes suggested that maybe Scott Eastwood would be playing Nightwing unfortunately not and the movie is kind of overkill which is what we were promised and 
at the end of the day that does you know that isn't I, I don't know the the critics said that that you know at the end of the day that is um, that is too bad that hurts the film I I agree that it's overkill I don't think I, I think it just doesn't quite register it doesn't hit the way it should and the team don't really gel and Harley and the film have given up on logic but it's you know very gripping to watch one critic noted that it was the rare comic book movie that had you wondering about the inner lives of the characters and I would agree with that and the the, the story is over the top and contrived very true and that it has what one critic said that it has a kind of generic goth aesthetic I I suppose to, to an extent and cheap sentimentality that is definitely true and cliched moments meaningless plot points and excessively violent maybe yeah it, it, that is like I, I mentioned it's de deluded but uh, David Iyer but also that it's you know has this huge body count it does almost feel like it's it, it feels like it, it, it has something to prove or something that, you know, like, and I'm not saying they told David Iyer this or that he came up with this, but it does feel like someone felt the movie needs to have a huge death toll and, you know, and, and again, it's not, you know, you can, you can have a huge death toll and it's just that a lot of people are shot and you don't really see it. No, it's, there's, there's clearly you know the the squad kill some of these kind of men in very brutal ways you know it, it very much pushes the PG-13 and a critic said we don't really believe the nihilistic camaraderie between the squad members the characters pose too much which Maybe, yeah. And it does feel like some of that was for the trailers. You know, posing works well for trailers, but yeah. And one critic pointed out that when Enchant when June Moon's alter ego is at her most evil, she does this kind of Bob Hope like hula dance with let's see if I can quote directly snaky snaky arms and like and moving hips I don't, I don't remember the exact quote and yet it's filmed you know completely seriously and yeah that's kind of true I'm, I'm not sure if everybody else in the maybe maybe I noticed it especially because I had read that quote but yeah, it's is absolutely true. That is that is a thing that happens in the movie and it's it's pretty silly. And the the movie doesn't really know how to start it it keeps going back and forth between you know first it has to do the roll call thing and then you know yeah it it keeps seeming like okay now we're gonna get going and then something else happens
and one critic said that the Joker is overblown, underwritten, and non-threatening. I'm not sure I'd quite agree with that. Not 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 to a great extent, at least. I did find him quite scary, and he's he's very intense. One critic said that David Iyer is often a careless writer, and he is again here. Yeah, to to an extent. But the the squad members do get to be bad. They they get to be as violent and yeah, that you know as as you would expect from them. Some say it's there's too much fan service. I think I think the amount was basically fine. There's as as one example, there's this brief bit where they talk about how great Joker and Harley Harley Quinn are together. Harley Quinn are together and there's this very brief flash of her in the full jester outfit. From the and and that's actually I'm gonna get more into her look, but I can see why it's it's you know right out of the animated show. But yeah, that look would definitely not have worked in in this movie. I'm not saying that it could not ever have worked in a live action, but not the DCEU, not as it's been established so far. Even if you tint the colors the way they have with, you know, Superman. No, they, they simply would not be able to make that work here. Which is not me saying that I think that what they did choose is entirely un unproblematic, but yeah. And the... One critic said, "It's it's the question isn't whether the movie is as good as the Avengers. It's whether it's as bad as, excuse me, as Green Lantern. I don't think it ever gets, excuse me, anywhere near as bad as Green Lantern. But it definitely is not the Avengers. It's, I suppose, at times, roughly on the level of one of the worst." X-Men franchise films. In, not in all ways. There, there are definitely things in the the worse X-Men franchise films that are far, far worse than anything in this. But I will, yeah, I don't know, maybe the, the reviewer said that because Green Lantern also has Amanda Waller. One reviewer, I, I think this again was not not an established critic said that it moved much too fast you know before less than an hour into the movie it felt like it was gonna end soon and yeah it, it does kind of and and then around the middle and in the second half I, I guess it kind of ends up slowing down some for a while and just but but yeah the the first portion of the film feels like it's it's in a real hurry and I already mentioned the you know we don't really need more origin stories I don't think that they needed to show us the you know the the individual recruitment of the members and then exactly how it's all if this movie had opened with the squad crashing in the helicopter and then you see all these you know colorful and and big personalities kind of stepping out of the wreck and then over the course of it you learn something more about the individual characters but i don't think i mean if if you go into this movie and you're like you know they they they're the very stars but they're bad guys if you go into the movie and you really have that mindset, I'm not sure you're going to get behind it. And it, the, the movie does try to say, no, 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 look, there's built-in deniability. 
They're, they're really, really powerful, and we do have leverage on them, and, and we have a kill switch. We can kill any one of them at any time. Press of a button. Again, this is literally, this is shown very early on. Okay, this, this individual is not, okay, we, we kill them, and press the button. The, the, that individual dies, that's it. So that there's no, but if you go in into this just thinking, you know, that doesn't make sense, I'm not sure the movie is going to be able to really sell you on, especially with how fast it's moving early on. I, I feel like, yeah, it crashes and, okay, Rick Flag, this is clearly a military guy. Then you see Amanda Waller giving orders. Okay, I'm getting how, you know, I, I think... Maybe I praise this aspect more than I should, but in Avengers 2 Age of Ultron, Joss Whedon went into it saying, well, maybe people who watch this haven't watched any of the others. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave enough hints that people can still pick up. At the start of Avengers Age of Ultron, you see the team fighting together. I maintain you can go into that movie and just as you see all these different even if you don't know what any of them mean clearly these are you know I mean you you see the Hulk there and it's like it's is that guy is that thing dangerous and over the course of the film you understand okay that's why he's still on the team that's why they think having this big green you know, seemingly out of control thing, why why they think that it's it's okay. And I think this movie could have done something similar. But as we see every single one of them be recruited and then they learn about the mission and then it didn't need to be an origin story and it didn't need to show each individual character have some brief scene before they're recruited and yeah it, it would have flowed better I would say if it just gradually you know every so often there would be one of these flashbacks and it would and, and again they, they would have to be altered as well for it to work but I do think that it could have worked without all this and which is I'm not saying I don't think there's really any scene that has nothing you know there's there's still humor and like personality and and these things but yeah you know the the first X-Men movie doesn't show the team being assembled you see the different members and then you're told this is how it happened and it it just works you know th that movie did have less to you know it, it had a lot of characters to introduce but the overall concept wasn't It's not quite as outlandish as some things in this are. And yeah, the, the so so it did have a, a better hand to play, but I'm not sure that metaphor anyway. But I, I do think that this could have been handled better. Yeah. The yeah, when, when I picked up the, the first of, of the books I mentioned, you know, I, I could tell, okay, this is not the first Suicide Squad, clearly. But it it starts mid-mission, and I knew nothing about these characters going in. And over the course of reading, okay, so this can, oh, okay, I, I understand. And that works. And, yeah, I, I do think that this could have done something similar. Maybe that will also work better as a hook because as it is, they're at the, you know you're being told what's going on, you know, and you basically know. So so it's like I said, you know, there's there's fun, there's there's character there, but you basically know what's happening. It's not really hugely surprising you, which 
yeah, if it just, if the first thing you saw was this, you know, gunship crashing and then all these different people emerge, you're like, who's that? What's that? Did, did that character just, and then you're interested, you know, and over the course of it, yeah. Which, again, is what happens if you go into Age of Ultron not knowing anything. Now... The... There's a distracting amount and at times really loud music in this. Link Hara points out that Harley Quinn should look like Harlequin, and again, I they couldn't quite have gone as far as the animated show, but they could do. I can understand complaints regarding what they ended up with, and. Blockbuster Buster said of the, the first trailer that Marco Robbie was just pretending to be crazy. It didn't, you know, that that's not a crazy girl, that's a girl pretending to be crazy. But and, and I agree about that trailer, but I do think that in in the final product it does work. I, I believe that this character was crazy. And that's also they. There are clips in this movie that are not. That, you know, there's there's stuff in this movie that you did not see clips from, in in the trailers and the TV spots. It's it's you know some of the most disturbing. And yeah, it's yeah. I I completely believe that this character is crazy, and I think I know why. And. I'm not going to name names, but, you know, because this is going to be an amalgamation of, not unlike the Amalgam universe, what some of Brad Jones, the Cinema Snob's friends, have said about Harley Quinn. Basically, she was a great character, but the, the fans screwed her up and really fast, and part of that is this kind of fetishizing of her, the, the sexy cosplay, and every iteration would have less clothing than the last and you know it's it's important to note she's not a strong female character she's one of Joker's victims to get more into Harley's look in this you know you basically got this cotton candy colored hair and pronounced eyeshadow which is now teal and pink rather than the blue and red of the new 52 or the classic black and red although she does I, I read that she wielded an umbrella which is black and red in this I'm not sure that yeah, I that might have ended up on the cutting room floor. Maybe I just forgot. But like I said, she does very briefly appear in the actual Harley Quinn classic, full-on Harlequin. Yeah, as in the animated show. And she's also wearing these glittery hot pants, and those are blue and red rather than teal and pink. Overall, I like it fine. It is brighter and more colorful than Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, which is part of the idea with the character. You know, black and red isn't the most colorful, but there's supposed to be this kind of energy and personality to it. And I do like the classic, and I, I think it worked well there. I'm not sure it would be as interesting here and you know apparently the creator of the character Paul Dini 
said you know he likes the look it's it's optimistic and promising so yeah and the you know David Iyer apparently always wanted Margot Robbie for the role although others were considered Emma Roberts who I don't really know from very much Olivia Thoroughby again I don't know her from much I think she'd be fine from what I do know the always oh, very um, unfortunately named Imogene Poots I'm not sure I've seen her in anything Alison Brie haven't seen her in anything Rooney Mara you know based on her the yeah the, the girl with the dragon tattoo I don't know I think you know obviously in that she's a very dark and kind of quiet loner character which you know I'm not saying she would do that exact same performance in this but based on that at least some of the elements she would be fine for Olivia Wilde I'm not sure I haven't seen her in enough to judge Emma Watson which I'm not sure I've seen her in anything but it would be kind of hilarious for actually scratch that Noah she, and she's quite good in that but excuse me it would be pretty funny for excuse me that yeah Her Hermione that's the name to go on to play something as out there and decidedly you know she's a fun character but she is mentally ill she's she enjoys hurting people you know Emily Browning who again I haven't seen in enough I, I definitely haven't seen her in anything where she was had enough energy to which again at, that's because of what I've seen her in basically Zoe Deschanel who I don't know for much Lily Collins I don't know for much the Sarah Paxton, I'm not sure I've seen anything. I'm at Seyfried. I think she could do fine. And Emma Rachel Wood, who I don't I don't think I've seen her in enough to properly judge. And uh, right, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who I haven't seen enough. But but yeah, the what it boils down to is is this Harley Quinn too sexy? And you know, part of it might be from casting Margot Robbie, who and I realize she's done other things since then, but the first thing people think of is Wolf on Wall Street, and there she is decidedly sexual. So the I'm I'm not saying that the a, a sexualized character is a bad thing, but I I can understand those saying that she shouldn't be quite that sexual. She, you know, there's obviously when she's with Joker, there's sexuality there, and she's she flirts with him. But yeah, in in general, I'm I'm not sure she would be quite this. But yeah. I do want to know in the comic she's basically as sexualized at times more what she wears in this is more or less what she wears in the comics but you know maybe the people who don't like it here dislike it there as well but in the comics they actually give her full on cleavage which yeah I will say I, I do feel like the camera was very eager to show off her ass and the you know they have her do this kind of exaggerated walk as well that really highlights that and I I don't think that's just her the, the you know June Moon's alter ego also has pronounced cleavage and I wanna say there's at least one more character 
that I really noted as at at times katana also the you know basically it's basically her top is very tight and yeah and I suppose you know an argument could be made that that's that's comic books you know they are these idealized bodies which is obviously more you know it matters more when it's a woman who's very idealized and sexualized because women are objectified more but even with that argument yeah I, I do think that they went too far in this it, you know I, I know that Margot Robbie said that Harleen doesn't put on the, the hot pants to get people to look at her ass. She puts on the hot pants because they're, they're kind of cute and colorful and such. But I don't think that whoever on the crew made that decision was thinking these are going to be, you know, no. That individual thought what's the best way we can get people to, you know, You'll note that in the, the trailers, they, they really liked showing, you know, her smashing glass and then bending over slightly. So, yeah. And that really, that isn't what the character should be sold on. But, you know, she does have the accent down, the manic energy and this kind of comical twist to her actions. And Margot Robbie said that, you know, you never know how she's going to react. She might laugh, she might hug you, she might shoot you. And like in the comic, Joker made her. And... You know, she's one of the most manipulative members of the squad. And basically she and Joker has this incredibly unhealthy relationship, but it's also a really addictive relationship. And though there was a lot of rehearsal for the movie, Harley's scenes with the Joker were not rehearsed so you know there was this really kind of unpredictable you know tension and feel to them and that worked fairly well and I suppose I've already mentioned the bat flex seems slightly more disturbed in this than in Donald Justice which is impressive and you know David Iyer's you know initial scene from the villain's perspective, which makes me wonder: Dawn of Justice wasn't supposed to be from the villain's perspective on him. He doesn't have a ton of screen time, but he doesn't just show up and pose either. The you know there is a thing or two he does that's actually there's this there's this bit that seems really weird. I I don't know if they just ran out of money. For or, or you know didn't want to do the stunt or something, but yeah, you you see it in the in the trailers. It's not it's not really a spoiler. Basically, he jumps from the Batmobile onto the Joker's car, and you see him start to get out of the Batmobile as it's driving, and then you hear him land on the roof, and then it cuts, and then you see him on the roof, but you don't see him crawl onto the Batmobile or jump from the Batmobile to the Joker's car and I just feel like even if you had to do with like effects or you had to partially cheat just the fact that you don't see it at all just makes it feel a little a little weird I, I feel like if they were gonna do that they didn't need to show him start to get out of the car or necessarily even the car drive up to them you could just hear oh there's another car driving so, wait is that and then he lands and then you know but yeah, as it is, it just feels cheap. Now, I quite like casting AAA 
I'm not gonna attempt to, yeah, as Killer Croc. But then they went and did the, you know, his his look practically, which is kind of reminiscent of, you know, the the Fantastic Fours, the thing from, you know, the the old the two old movies of Fantastic Four and yeah and maybe part of it is that I'm used to Killer Croc from Arkham Asylum there he's huge he's like two and a half people tall and he does actually eat people in this you know in, in that game it's said you know oh, that's just a rumor yeah, hear it actually, but you know, I in in the excuse me in the comics I read, he wasn't on the squad. I'm not sure he has been, but King Shark was, who has some of the same. Yeah, and you know, and he does genuinely in those comics eat and bite off limbs. I'm not sure he bit anything off, but he does bite people, you know, avocado men, and. Yeah, I'm fair. You know, you you briefly see him. Yeah, it's it's pretty clear that he eats. Yeah, and apparently the the idea of originally he it was going to be King Shark in this, but he would have to be full CGI. So they went with. Killer Croc, and, and definitely it would have been ridiculous to try to do King Shark and not do it full CGI, but yeah, it's it's a little, it's it's too bad, but he is still pretty cool. In, in the trailers, they don't give him a lot of personality, he, he basically growls and looks mean and, and that's it, whereas the rest have some defining moments in the trailers. He doesn't have a lot of personality here. Again, King Shark in the comics has more to him than this. Now, Deadshot, you know, they they looked at DiCaprio, Brad Pitt. I th I think Brad Pitt would have been interesting, especially considering Fury. Daniel Craig, who I haven't seen in much. Matthew McConaughey, who I definitely haven't seen him enough to say Johnny Depp I think he could have been interesting Colin Farrell who I also think I think Colin Farrell would have been fairly ideal especially if they went with the the comic book one because Colin Farrell can do this kind of reserved kind of thing without coming off as just boring flat or just kind of an ass and yeah, that is very much what he is. Like. And Keanu Reeves was look at. I kind of hope that if they do, I'm I'm not. I would like to see this cast again. But if they ever do, or maybe if just like someone, you know, puts together enough money to just you know, and and gets Reeves interested, and they do just like a little short film or something. I think Keanu Reeves would nail Deadshot, especially based on how he is in Street Kings. They looked at Oscar Isaac, who I haven't seen enough to judge. Jason Statham, who I think would have been okay, but I think they would have made the character more kind of sarcastic and yeah, give him, you know, made him less reserved to fit Statham. Idris Elba, who I don't really think I've seen him enough to say, but I based on his Heimdall, I think he could be quite good. Matt Damon, who, you know, based on his born yeah. He he could he could nail it definitely. And Joseph Gordon Levitt. I don't know. I feel like you know he was an okay idea for maybe like a Robin, but I don't think he 
could have been a good dead shot. Alexander Skarsgård, who I haven't seen enough. Ewan McGregor, it's been a while since I saw him in anything, but I don't think he has the kind of darkness to, yeah. Robert Pattinson, I don't, I, it's, it's kind of like with Kristen Stewart, I don't really blame him for the whole Twilight thing, but I haven't seen him in, in, I don't think I've seen him in anything at all. Fassbender, who I think, I think he could have done it. He could have done the, the comic justice. Joel Kinnaman, who instead is Rick Flagg. And, and I believe this is the first thing I see him in. No, I, I don't think he could really have done Not Not based on what he does here. And John Hamm, who I haven't seen enough to, to judge, but I'm dancing around the issue. We have a black dead shot. Look, when I see a black man, I expect him to be a thug who wields a gun and has killed countless people. Okay, F fair enough. And he, you know, he uses the, the wrist gun, so he does actually fire a gangster style as well. He does wear the mask some of the time, and he kind of has, in the comics, he has an actual cybernetic eye. In this, it's basically, he, he has this little thing that he puts on. It's like, it's like half a glass, you know, if you took a pair of glasses and only took, you know, it's a monocle. It's a full-on monocle, which does have some of the properties of the cybernetic eye. But, yeah, they, they, when, when this was first announced, uh, you know, after this was first announced, that they cast Will Smith, Filmbrain put it, they played the Will Smith card, and it very much, it, you know, he's, I forget who said it, but someone recently said he's a professional film star. When you put him in your movie, you're basically, yeah, you, you know that you're going to make a lot of money. He attracts a big crowd, so, yeah, and he does do some, you know, they, they very clearly had lines in this that worked for him, you know, when very early on, as he's being recruited, he said, in, in the trailer, he full-on says, y'all jokers must be crazy. I, I want to say that the movie toned that down a little bit, and then, you know, there's this bit where he's like, you know, saying, yeah, it's, it's not really a spoiler, he has to get Diablo to release the, the fire kraken, as it were, and, you know, after he, he badgers him for a bit, and then Diablo goes for it, and then he's like, I was, I was just trying to get you there, we, we cool, you know, yeah, again, very much something that, you know, some, some, you, you could say that it's, it's writing for a black character. It's in, in part that, but it's also very, very much for this kind of, you know, sassy black man that Will Smith is known to, known for playing. And, you know, he turned down reprising his beloved role in Independence Day for this. You know, he could have been in Independence Day 2 much denser, I'm sorry, Resurgence. And it appears that he made the right choice there, but you know, he basically, he's, yeah, he he seems to think that the the idea there was that it that the reason after earth didn't do so well with with him in this role was because it was sci-fi rather than it being because he was this 
flat and boring and not at all charming character in that which nobody pays to see Will Smith be and that again brings up the issue here that yeah you know in yeah you know can he be charming here and at times he he does the charm and he certainly does the you know there's there's more of a threat more of an edge more of a bite to his character here you know the, the, in this he plays what some people feared he would be playing in the prince of bel air you know so yeah you know and and i when you see him in this you do believe that this guy would kill for money and yeah the the There, there's definitely some Will Smith here, but they did also. I, I feel like they found a decent middle ground between this, you know, more kind of reserved character and then Will Smith being Will Smithy. But yeah, I, I don't. Like I said, I, I only read the comics to get into this, and then I love the comics, but I don't have much of an attachment to to Deadshot in the comics so it didn't and I'm not a Will Smith fan so it didn't it didn't bother me particularly but I don't think I don't think anyone going in and if, if you don't have much of an opinion either way like me it's not gonna bother you but if you go into the movie thinking oh it's Will Smith or I can't wait to see Deadshot you're probably going to be at least somewhat disappointed. Basically, in the comics, he is this kind of reserved, very serious, deadpan, at times kind of hateful, angry, bitter person. You know, the, the basically, he lost his family as a child because some mob goons were killing junkies that had, you know, stolen from them. From, from this mob and yeah they, they just shot them and some of the bullets went through the wall and hit his family and thus he you know he dedicated himself to making every bullet count and yes he went ahead and killed the the mob goons who killed his family and you know this this isn't actually in the movie we don't really get to know a lot about why he is the way he is in the movie. We just know why he might want to not be completely like this, but yeah, you know, there's and and I do, you know, that also does like the when he is like that in in the comics, that is also him without in, in this he has a daughter, which he does in some of the comics when he is at his most angry and hateful that is before he he I, f I forget if it's before he has the door before he knows much about the door but you know so yeah they they opted for this you know other version which also i i do hope that you know i, I don't know i guess it's it's unlikely we'll get another live action of quite this maybe if they take another character and kind of turn him into you know take a character that nobody really cares about and just slap that name onto a proper dead shot I would like to see that a a, a, a dead shot that isn't you know about this kind of family I, I I like the comic dead shot and I would like to see him now Basically, he's incredibly fast, in, including when he, you know, fires incredibly accurately, and he knows martial arts, and he's basically a, a mercenary assassin, and I did kind of worry we'd have this kind of, you know, Origins Wolverine, Agent X kind of thing. It's not really like that. He's, 
yeah, he's he's nowhere near that kind of bland and, and forgettable and yeah. And David Iron points out, you know, he's mercenary by day and concerned father by night. And but he still does like going out there and killing people. I mentioned I, I went into the the music some earlier. Another thing is you know most of the music you hear in the trailers and TV spots also does appear in the movie now basically Deadshot and Harley are basically allies but they don't really know you know what's going on with the rest of the squad and Deadshot does have at least one scene with Batfleck Captain Boomerang. I was not sure they were actually going with Captain. In the you know sometimes he is just called Boomerang, which you know Captain. It's it's a very comic booky name, Captain Boomerang. They actually yeah they full on he is Captain Boomerang. They refer to him as that several times. So yeah they they weren't trying to run away from that. Basically, he's in in the comics. He's more of an assassin. In this, he's basically a, a thief. But he's this very rugged, unpredictable, mouthy character. Katana is trying to kill him, and he's like flirting with her, trying to get her to go out on a date with him and such, repeatedly. And the. And I believe this is Boomerang the father, not the son. And you know, I, I you know, you might think, you know, aren't you know these you know, specialized boomerangs too silly? I, I feel like in the early trailers it looked more like it was just knives or like straight maybe straight razors. He didn't you didn't really see him throw them and you didn't see the full shape and such, but yeah, then later on they did show him throwing one of the boomerangs and then catching it, and yeah. And basically, you know, he has extremely sharp boomerangs, and in, in the comics he also has some that are charged with energy. In this he does have at least one that has this kind of... Yeah, it's, it's basically... It's... It's got like a, a small computer on it, and like it, he uses it to spy a little bit. He throws in there's this little camera, and then they, you know, can can look at what the camera tapes. And I don't know. I feel like that's a little too. I I get that you know they wanted to give him more to do basically, but. I don't know, I, I just feel it, it wouldn't be able to give you a very good image, and not for very long since it's nice, but you know, it, it works fine for them in the movie, so I can only assume that it actually, I don't know, maybe it just stops a bit in the way, air and then just sort of spins around to keep itself from from falling down or something. I, I don't know quite how, I don't know, actually I suppose it's possible that he threw it and then it lodged into something and from there filmed. Actually, yeah, I, I suppose that that could definitely be what happened. Now, the in, in, in the comics, he he's not a fan of tight spaces and heights. That doesn't really come into play here. It's, I, I suppose they don't they don't contradict that either, but yeah. And in the comics, he never shuts up. You know, in in the trailer, you, you see him yelling in his cell, and at first, it you know he he's yelling out this little, you know, they they have this little they can they can open to look into the cell. He yells through that, and then that gets shut, and then you see him yelling into this 
you know, security camera. Yeah, that's that's his character in the, in the comic. He's not quite like the the character in the comic as much in this. You know, otherwise he you know, in the comic he he can be somewhat pathetic and Deadshot messes with him easily and a lot. He's kind of comic relief. In this, he is somewhat tougher, but I also feel like he was somewhat underused. They didn't he doesn't do a lot and he really didn't need to be here. I, I feel like if they hadn't he's in a lot of the comic and that's that's why he's here. You know it's it's somewhat the same with, with Killer Croc, who would have been King Shark. You know, great in the comic, but they didn't give him a lot to do here. You know, Katana also doesn't, but she's less of a She's not one of the main squad members, but you know, Deadshot, Harley Quinn, and I suppose who does that leave? And and I suppose you could add Rick Flag in there. He does have a decent amount to do. Really, it's they they don't waste a lot of characters, but you know I mean I mentioned that Deadshot messes with them. There's really always egos clashing in the comics. You know at one point in the movie he, you know he's got this beer can and he he, he sips it when you know basically because he can at at that point, and I. I, I rather like Jai Courtney in what I've seen him in and you know I wasn't sure if they were going to give him the over-the-top accent that in in the word balloons and such sometimes reads like a really over-the-top and he's got he uses an, um, a, a bunch of slang he's got the over-the-top accent and and uses some slang but yeah they like I said, they it's not quite the same characters in the comics. He's a very stereotypical Australian kind of yeah, in this. And Jai Courtney even kind of you know, when when he talked about the role, he whether he wanted to or not, kind of fell into that stereotype actually kind of saying that, you know, it's it's great that, you know, he is an Australian getting these other, you know, roles that, you know, other, you know, nationalities, but if an Aussie didn't get the role as an Aussie, oh, that, you know, that would not end well, you know, because to an Aussie, you know, it's always one wrong look from, away from a pub crawl turning into a pub brawl. I absolutely love it. And, you know, Tim mentioned the Chasers War and everything, ostentatious. I maintain that in Chappie, when Hugh Jackman pulls a gun, loaded gun, seem seemingly loaded gun, to an employee in the middle of the day, in front of everyone, in the office, he may very well just be messing around. You know, he... You know, it's when you see the scenes like, wait, did he actually just threaten him? Is he, you know, would he actually shoot him there if it didn't go as he wouldn't? I maintain he may very well, but you know, then after that he says, we should go, to, we should go to church sometime. That was southern. Never mind. He may very well have meant, let's go to church sometime, and the rest was just him messing around. There's, yeah. Anyway. The the yeah he's he's very much this you know he's he's a character who yeah he is this you know uncouth character and you know Deadshot tells him you talk too much in in the comics and that's that that sums up the the two of them and their relationship fairly well. Rick Flagg is this really good, responsible military leader kind of 
he's he's stands in stark contrast to the rest of the squad. And you know, you see in the trailers, the Harleen's like, oh, he's he's ashamed of us. How cute and. Yeah, it's he really does not want to be in charge of them. He he tells Amanda to her face, "I will get you some great military men. We don't have to work with these, you know, horrible horrible people." But you know, nevertheless, he executes her orders even if he doesn't agree with them. He you know, after he meets her, he's like, Everybody told me the, these horrible stories about you, but I didn't believe them. And she's like, nobody does. And yeah, that's very much, he. he's like, I should never, what did I sign up? This is not what I signed, I didn't sign up for this, you know. And he's an expert tactician, strategist, you know, he knows martial arts, and he's incredibly capable with any gun. And yeah, Joel Kinnaman, as I already mentioned, I believe this is the first thing I see him in. Tom Hardy, you know, was considered for it, but, you know, because scheduling, you know, he basically he was busy brutalizing Leonardo DiCaprio. I really think that he would have been too big and tough for the role. You know, I could see him as maybe Killer Croc, you know, going by them casting AAA in this, but I I don't think, I, I wouldn't quite believe that the others would so easily stand up to Rick if he were Tom Hardy sized and shaped. And then we have, I suppose, I, yeah, basically Rick Flagg leads them, but they're not always afraid to defy him, but he's not, you know, he does genuinely threaten, okay, I will blow up the, the head if you, yeah. And Diablo is not in a lot of the comic, but he's, he's good in both the comic. That's it, that was the member, that was, a, excuse me, at least one member that I had forgotten about, which excuse me, I guess also tells you some, he's, he's more dramatic, he's more interesting as far as what they do with him, drama and, and such, than the two mentioned that don't get a lot to do. Ultimately, he doesn't get a lot to do action-wise either, really, and early on, he's really reluctant to get into the fight because he doesn't really want to use his powers, and I get what that is, but I do feel like, you know, and it ends up being Deadshot who provokes him into using his powers. And it's just, I don't, I don't believe that Rick Flagg and Amanda Waller would put up with that. I feel like the moment that he was reluctant to fight, one of the two should have said, your head is gone if you don't start fighting. I can accept that he doesn't want to use his powers, but then maybe he just starts fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, or maybe he grabs something that he can then hit them with, because his big problem is he doesn't want to use his powers. The Yes, he also doesn't want to be violent anymore, but no, I just I don't believe that Rick Flagg or Amanda Waller comic or film version, this film version of the, these, yeah, I don't believe that they would put up with it. It's, it's one of those cases where they sacrifice the credibility to work in the, the drama better, and yeah, they just, they, they go too far in that direction. Basically, he, you know, he's a former LA gang member who can summon and control flames and he doesn't want to use his flames anymore. He He's minimized it to just a single solitary flame at just like at the palm of his hand and you know because he hurt someone he loved with the the powers and you know the the actor said that, you know, he basically, he doesn't want to, he wants to stay out of the fight, whereas the rest of the Suicide Squad 
is happy to get out there and kill people and yeah that's very much the case and I do think they they do eventually do something other, you know something that's not only dramatic but also just you know what we kind of came to see. He, he uses his power more in the last portion of the film and that is fairly cool although some would say that it goes a little too far and I I can kinda see yeah it's one of those things where the last portion of the movie is a different movie than the rest of it as is as is sometimes the case with these movies comic book adaptation movies and for playing the Joker Jared Leto completely submerged himself to this character and you know, I'm not gonna get into the the messed up stuff he did to the the, the rest of the cast and, and such but you know dude went just it's, it's like Jared Leto would you would it kill you to go out of character just a little bit during the shooting? It might kill you if you never leave character, but yeah. And on that, you know, I do feel sorry for him having, you know, Heath Ledger left big shoes to fill. Shoes to fill. The, you know, others have pointed out the you know where Heath Ledger's Joker is pure evil this one is somewhat more sympathetic you can more understand though he is still very yeah you know he's he yeah he's he's a very scary person still and you know the the visual design is as others have noted overstuffed and yeah we all like the visual design there's no yeah I saw someone though say you know oh it's this design of the Joker isn't timeless not all of them have to be that's that's a really bad argument against this is clearly not supposed to be particularly like, you know, the, the yeah, the, this person went on to say in, in 10 years when we look back at this, we're going to say, oh man, that was real. Yeah, I don't think that's a reason not to do something. The, I, I agree that the Joker has stayed very close to how he originally looked for a very long time and in most and in most iconic incarnations but that doesn't mean that you can't do a version that is more modern or somewhat different from that. And basically, you know, and, and he does indeed use the the you know the the I want to say gold tinted and and such AK from End of Watch to find out. The, the best laugh, he pra he tried out different laughs in public to see which made people the most uncomfortable. And he, he landed on something fairly fitting. He shaved off his brows and yeah, it, it works. That helps make him seem, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a unibrow, I guess it's a, it's a nana brow. It, it, I can't explain it, but yeah, there is something when you can't see the eyebrows. It just it does something, you know. When Keanu Reeves, when when he talked about you know for for on the DVD of the first Matrix movie, he talks about how you know when he wakes up inside the 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 pod, he had to shave it off his eyebrows for that and when people would talk to him they wouldn't quite look in, him in the eye when they did and yeah it is it's it's off-putting it's unsettling and 
I do want to note when we see him he's usually wearing like a fancy suit or something he's you know we don't see the tattoos that much you know he he's not shirtless he's not even bare armed for very much of the film I'm not saying that the the you know the problems with the tattoos remain problems but we don't see them that much in the film as others have put it the tattoos are loud both in amount and content. David Iyer says he added them to give the Joker more of a modern gangster gangster look and yeah, I I see where he's coming from, but yeah, the the problems remain. And and you can you know they at, at one point they put it that the Joker was the king of Gotham and Harley was his queen. And yeah, you know, he is a gangster. He's, he's always been a crime lord of some, you know. So yeah, you know, and I, I, I want to say in the Arkham. The first two games that he's listed a what was it a professional criminal you know it's yeah where where he ledgers is a terrorist so excuse me yeah that yeah I I get that but it's yeah it's excessive nevertheless you know saying that the character is going to have tattoos is not the same as covering his you know his chest and and such but the you know yeah the the dead eyes the the tattoos and this kind of you know juggalo joker with grills kind of thing don't get me wrong I'm not a fan of the posse like everyone else when I look at them, I see P. The, I don't think that the grills are too big a part of this take on the iconic smile. Like I said, sometimes he does smile full on with the grills, and that is clearly supposed to be impactful, and it's not, it's not as impactful as they think it's, as they thought it would be. But when he doesn't, you know, when he just smiles without showing his teeth, he can be very intense and and in general he can be very intense but you know the the basically the the idea of the the iconic smile is that it's supposed to be kind of grotesque and off-putting and a at least a partial deformity and yeah grills just does not do that but the the lips are still really pronounced red and yeah it it works when he's not it works better when he's not and yeah you know Heath Ledger this has been said a million times but Heath Ledger's were a really great new take on that you know it's not the always really happy smile though it, you know it has the the shape of the always happy you know wide grin smile kind of thing but for a different reason and yeah it's a great alternate kind of modern brutal take on that they, they weren't going to have such cuts like that to his face in 1940 but today you know yeah and then you have this thing of which, why does he have those scars? You know, he keeps giving different backgrounds for it, and they are very 
disturbing and terrifying. You know, again, having just rewatched them, if a while passes between two of your viewings of The Dark Knight, and if you don't watch that movie more than once, you've, you've taken a wrong turn somewhere along the way in your life. If a lot of time passes between two viewings of it, you maybe forget just how messed up these, you know, the, the, the idea that as a child, his father, you know, cut the face of, yeah, and, and this thing of, he tries to cheer her up, his, his wife, and, you know, he goes too far, but it's, it's, Yeah, the, the, you know, this, this kind of, you know, twist to it, I, ironic, don't you think? You know, with, with, she can't stand the sight of me, she leaves, now I see the joke, you know, the, yeah, that's, that's really impactful, and that's the, you know, you might say the the Joker. The first thing you notice is that smile, and yeah, instead of the this kind of acid or you know chemical kind of thing, to have it be carved with a sharp blade. Yeah, you know that that really is a, a deeply disturbing and. Yeah, and and this is just not that good of an idea for one compared. You know, yeah, regardless. But you know, you you have him as this creepy, crazy, demonic clown, and the you know gritty, sadistic. He he does have less color here and somewhat less of like thematic weapons and you know but but he does enjoy hurting people and I'm, I don't think he uses acid in any time but we do see him make Harley with the the chemicals and you know very maniacal and one is no, some someone online noted that he's the most coldly homicidal Joker, and yeah, that, yeah, and the the, you know, we do get this really compelling visual, which thankfully is in the film, of him lying on the floor laughing manically as the camera pans out to show, you know, he has all these knives laid out and further away you have guns and then you have these like infant clothes on th yeah, just that is seriously messed up and this, you know, he, he does do some twisted disturbing stuff but it's not it's it's very much not his film and that really is too bad given that he you know Heath Ledger obviously it's that's his film and it's you know Jack Nicholson also that's his film and that again you know there are a lot of things about the 89 Batman that have only aged so so but Jack Nicholson's Joker really is seriously messed up. You know, I, I the when 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 he has like a drink tossed in his face and he acts as though it's melting his skin, which we know has been deformed. We we don't know how much can it actually take, and so we genuinely think, you know, and then he like goes boo at the yeah that's that is really 
disturbing and yeah there's there's nothing quite that effective he he does not take charge of this film and really you know he given that he's not the villain how could he but it's just it's too bad it's it's the first live action joker in a while that just he's a he's something of a bit player he's in the movie because harley's in the movie if harley wasn't in the movie the she's the one thing that gives him any purpose in the movie and he couldn't if you straight up tried to cut him from the film as it is now you would have problems but if you had written him out it wouldn't have changed much and that is not something I should be able to say about the Joker now And he doesn't particularly, you know, prank. Although he do, he will sometimes laugh when it's really when when you feel like this this is not the time to laugh, you know. And he's not quite as manic as Alexi Eisenberg. Am am I not a fan of that? Ding 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 ding. And he is definitely psychotic. He, Jared Leto himself said of the character, he's almost Shakespearean and a beautiful disaster. And he took a pretty deep dive and he would prepare by being alone, listening to gospel from the 20s and studying shamanism and yeah, and, and also based in part on cartel bosses. Mexico and I didn't know quite what that was gonna mean before I watched watching it you can definitely see some of that in there and he did actually research with you know with doctors and spend time with psychopaths to learn yeah And then we have Amanda Waller, also known as The Wall. I like Angela Bassett in The Green Lantern, but, you know, that that continuity did not take off. So I, I don't know if that's why they recast her, but I do think Viola Davis is quite good as well. And, you know, basically... Yeah, she, she gives the orders for the squad. She has plans inside of plans. She's incredibly manipulative and an expert on logistics and strategy. She threatens the the squad members with, you know, blowing up their heads. And she does this in the comics a lot. And early on, it actually got kind of repetitive. And she does actually give orders through the whole film. It doesn't, didn't look like she necessarily would in the trailers, but... You know, she does in the comics, and she does actually do so in the movie as well. Now, for June Moon and her alter ego, they considered Troyan Belisario, who I don't know from anything, but I do like that, yeah, they actually have that many members of the Belisario family who work within, you know... I'm not saying I like JAG and NCIS, but I do respect that he's started several shows and then like you know I, I forget how I want to say it's his son appears in JAG and even a little NCIS and yeah anyway Blake Lively was considered I I want to say I've seen her in wasn't she in the town I don't remember her in that but yeah so I, I couldn't say Brie Larson Again, don't really know. Yeah. Or was the other one Allison Brie? I, I have no frame of reference for either Brie. I like the cheese. Sarah's Ronan, who I don't have enough of a feel on to say if she would have been good. Megan Fox, I haven't seen her in much, but yeah, I'm pretty glad it wasn't her. 
Ellen Page, I don't know if she quite has the, the darkness to, to pull it off. Kristen Ritter, Emma Stone, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I know her well enough. Alicia Vikander, who I've only seen in Jason Bourne, I, based on that I don't think quite, but then, you know, from what I hear about Ex Machina, maybe, and the Shining Woodley, don't think I know her from enough. Amelia Clark, I've only seen her in Terminator Genesis. I mean, I hear that there's some pretty dark stuff with her character in Game of Thrones. Maybe. She she might have been able to pull it. You know, I, I believe, yeah, it wouldn't be the first time she was, like, covered in dirt and half-naked and such. So, yeah. Alexander Daddario, who I've seen in nothing. I, I like... Tara Delevingne in in this. I don't think I've seen her in anything else, but I thought she did great as June Moon and her alter ego. She June Moon is this archaeologist who's been possessed by this ancient evil, you know, ancient evil force that's like a sorceress. And I worried slightly that we were looking at another Dark Phoenix, Dark Phoenix. Yeah, a great character in the comics, but didn't work so well in the movie. I'm speaking specifically of The Last Stand, not, you know, not X2, but... Yeah, she, she it works much better, but this is also a movie that embraces this supernatural thing, where, yeah, The Last Stand was... Yeah, not, not so much. And, yeah, in this, you genuinely, you believe that this is... You know, you see her incredibly powerful, and she remains a credible threat throughout. So, again, different from, yeah, Last Stand's Phoenix. And there's a, yeah, you, you really, you believe this ancient wrath kind of thing. You know, this is, we are talking about the character, you know, that, and that should have been how they did the Dark Phoenix in, in The Last Stand. She should have been the villain. Not just be standing around for a while, but, yeah, the, the, in this, it actually, she's like, they buried us for thousands of years. And, and I think it's her brother who, who asks, they, but they worshipped us, worshipped us before, and then she's like, they, they stopped. I want to annihilate them. And she tries. And you believe that there's a real chance she could succeed. I'm not going to give away whether or not she does, but you can probably guess. Yeah, the... the it, it works. They, they treat this kind of character the way it should be. And the, yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, and, and June Moon herself is kind of an adventurer, whereas her alter ego is this feral being. David Iyer asked her to walk nude at night, preferably in moonlight, through in in mud. Yeah, and she apparently she she got privacy by I, I want to say it's her sister's property, but yeah, and you know, at this point it's yeah that's if if you want to be in a David Iyer movie, yeah, and he he told the others some really messed up stuff. Will Smith gave us an example, and again not a spoiler. At one point, a character like plants a bunch of letters from Will Smith's, from from Deadshot's daughter in front of Deadshot, and David Iyer told Will Smith he just put a fetus on the table, and yeah, that's and it shows in his performance. So yeah, that was what David Iyer wanted, and he got it. And 
and yeah, they, they went for kind of a more of a dark Galadriel instead of this, you know, green clothes that, you know, in, in the film and I think they fared pretty well, you know, I I wouldn't have minded seeing more dark Galadriel in, the, in those films and, you know, apparently it is basically, we, we get as much dark Galadriel as, the, as is in the books, so but yeah, I really appreciated that the major villain in this was Doc Galadriel through the film, and yeah. And then we have Katana, who is basically Rick Flagg's bodyguard and friend. She's not part of the squad, so she doesn't have the you know the the kill switch implanted in her neck. And she yeah she uses a katana, duh, and she also knows martial arts. And she has this blade that can trap the souls of the people she kills, possibly including the Avocado Man. I'm not sure that's really confirmed because they don't this is, they don't seem to have personality still. They just know how to kill people. But yeah, and you know it's it's the kind of thing where you have to be careful. It something like that could get kinda silly. It's called the Soul Taker. I find that it really does walk that line. The Yeah, the, the actress says of the character she has you know, morals but at the same time she's willing to slice through hundreds of people in seconds if that's what's called for. And She's a widow, which is mentioned for just a few seconds. But what I love is that they felt the need to say it twice in a row. Basically, she's like, she's looking at the sword, and then she says, I forget the exact, let's just say, I miss you, my husband. And I guess, you know, and it's in subtitles, there's much of what, excuse me, whether whether you're speaking, um, you know, excuse me, it, you know, she's, she's Asian, so she speaks, I'm pretty sure, Asian. I'm not trying to be, uh, yeah, that, I'm not trying to be racist, that's, that's a cable guy reference. The, the... Yeah, she's she's not speaking English, so it's subtitled. And the ancient language that June Moon's alter ego speaks with with Incubus is also subtitled. So, yeah, but but the you know maybe they figured some people aren't going to read the subtitles. If you don't, you are going to be super lost about the whole Incubus thing. Yeah. Anyway, basically. She's she's literally just said this, and then I want to say it's Rick Flagg says she lost her husband, and then he he makes sure to also point out his soul is in that sword, which is it. I feel like they they filmed different things, and then maybe eventually it was you know, and then they went back. Oh hey, wait, we can just. We can have Rick say it, or we can have her, you know, literally talk to the, the thing. Maybe they changed the subtitles. I don't know if, if maybe they expected too few people to speak her language. But, yeah, just, just do one of those two. Like, it, it preferably her speaking to the, the sword. Which is slightly more compelling than it, it should be. And then there's Slipknot who can climb any surface. Also a member of the squad. And yeah, I, I've mentioned Flash Barry Allen, who you you know super speed. He very briefly appears in this for nothing, doing nothing that Batfleck couldn't have. And, you know, it, I guess 
you know, for for people who didn't think that the the clip of him in Dawn of Justice was good enough. Here's another clip of him. But the basically, you know, some of the members might just play along, you know, waiting to mutiny, you know, and the dynamic of the team is always changing in the comic. Not so much here, but, you know, they had so much else. I could imagine they could do it in a sequel, especially if they do the kind of, you know, X-Men 2, Avengers 2 thing of not having an awful lot of new major characters, you know, especially on the team, so that you can explore the characters that there are. Well, X-Men 2 doesn't do that much, but in, in theory. But, yeah, that would allow for that. But, yeah, you know, there is sort of this thing of everyone is just out for their, you know, trying to work for their own favor. And, you know, it's, it's a double agent kind of thing, just waiting for the right time to, you know, make your move. And, you know, I, I was really glad this is the first DCEU film where every character who has, um, like, alter ego name, actually, they, it's actually used. They call each other by that. You know, there's no, you know, oh, well, here, it's, it's an S. If you haven't watched... It's an S Superman. The the video with with Emily Emily Axford from College Room. You need to watch that video. It yeah that that was a video that needed to happen in response to that stupid scene in Man of Steel. But anyway, you know, might I suggest? And then it's cut off. There's no the Bat of Gotham. No, it's actually you know ag again rewatching the Nolan trip. Right there in the first movie, you know, he's here. Who's here? The Batman. That's how you do it. You know, that's that's creepy and impactful. But, yeah. the If everyone actually uses the name that, yeah. And they actually wear... You know, more or less a, a costume. You know, someone like Killer Croc doesn't really wear a costume, but his skin is that of a crocodile. So you don't really need much more than that. But yeah, they they more or less wear something that they would in the comic, and or a variation on that, and certainly a costume. You know, they don't they're not dressing to to fit in. You know. And apparently, David Iyer provided an onset therapist, which, considering the subject matter, I can completely understand. This has much more disturbing, both in, in quantity and in, you know, extent of the, of the individual ones, more disturbing material than his other films. Not combined, but, and, and not, not all of them, but, you know, yeah, a, a lot. And, you know, and, and as the Joker promises, he's not going to kill you. He's just going to hurt you really, really badly. Seriously, who taught Iron Grammar? And, you know, then there's the line of. You know, whoever taught him grammar should be put in a hole, and then we should throw away the whole man. There are a lot of dumb lines put right there in the trailers, and yes, those lines are in the movie. Now, I think I don't think this will majorly hurt Ayer's career. The I, you know, it it might. You know, it's not necessarily going to give the biggest boost, but his style does show through. 
And I think enough people are going to realize it's studio interference that, you know, and it still is a David Iyer film. It's just, it's diluted and the, you know, you can really tell that they put in comedy. I, I forget if I've said, but I'd say about half the comedy does work and the other half really doesn't. And, but, but yeah, you know, as one of his films, it's tense, intense, sharp. This isn't quite as tight or as fast-paced, not, not all of it, as his other films. But, you know, it is noteworthy that two of his last three films were series of situations films, not plot-driven ones, but... Yeah, I you know I absolutely love his work. Street Kings remains one of my all-time favorite movies, and I haven't been really disappointed by anything he's directed. Again, I haven't watched Sabotage yet, but I do hear from my friend and fellow reviewer Kermit Head that it might it might not really have been his fault, and there are parts of it that aren't really bad. It's it's the ending and there's something else that I forget that's especially bad. But I'm I'm not gonna pretend to defend that or anything. I haven't watched it yet. But yeah, even this there even even at its worst, I don't think this is really that bad or or bad enough to it doesn't make me doubt him as a director and you know it is interesting this is his first comic adaptation and the you know I forget who noted it but he really did completely go for the supernatural stuff which yeah you know this is the kind of thing where a lot would say, well, you know, I don't really want to go, no, they full on, which it's, it's, it's the one that most embraces the, you know, you'd almost, if, if you didn't know this was going to be part of the DCEU, you might not necessarily guess it if you look, if you focus a lot on the supernatural and the, the big, elements of this the like you know the the like the body count and stuff like that you know, sure but yeah the fact that the you know the the villains are these you know incredibly powerful supernatural beings the the many many goons are human were human and they've been transformed using magic the climax is decidedly about this magical thing and yeah you know it's it's much more comfortable with the magic than the the DCEU has been so far actually I don't know if he had to like convince them but it it works for the Suicide Squad the one of the first things that happens in the Suicide Squad comics that I read is that Rick Flagg is teleported to another dimension, or, or yeah, he's, he's teleported to another, and he encounters dinosaurs there, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a comic book, it goes for this really crazy stuff, and that's what we want, and that, that really is, this is the first DCEU film that really says, this is a comic book. This is based on a comic book, so this is and this is what you want from a comic book. So yeah, and, and not all of them are going to be that wild, but yeah, this this new incarnation of the of the Suicide Squad, it went there right away. And you know the the he wanted it to be more gritty and violent but you know there were these forced reshoots because of the countless problems with Dawn of Justice the one that the you know they zeroed in on the, the executives was oh it's it's too dark 
but it still really it's it's still very dark and yeah I, I get the I can imagine that the adding you know all these pop songs and such to lighten it up and to you know yeah it's at times it's kind of cheap I can imagine that was like okay we you know we have to convince people although did those early trailers come out before or after the reactions to the grim dark don't just anyway and the you know because they're so worried about oh our films are too dark that's why the Justice League trailer makes it look like a comedy. I, I hope there's action in that movie. I didn't see any in that trailer. When the, the Wonder Woman movie is eager to show badass action. And... The, you know, and, and you can tell that it's a PG-13 and you know it wants to be an R it, it pushes it you know pushing the the PG-13 rating past the norm has ironically become the PG-13 norm now it's it's the first PG-13 movie that Iyer directs he's written some that at least came out to be PG -13. you know the the SWAT is PG-13 for example But the, you know, it, his movies have language, slurs, and such, and they actually, they, they go just as far as they can with that in this, and, yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you, you get it, they, they actually, they use, they use just, just as, they they go just as far as they can. They they actually use really offensive, you know, language and and suggestions towards each other. And yeah, you know, if if I watched this and I didn't know it was Iyer and I hadn't watched Iyer in a long time, I would still say this is this is Iyer's writing and direction. And you know his movies are unflinching, disturbing, nasty, ugly, without hating the viewer. And yeah, that's still very much the case. It yeah, as as far as it can go with the PG-13. And uh, you know these characters that are hateful and hateable, although some might do some good. Yeah, still the case. And you know some sexuality, but strong women, and to an extent that is, you know, we do have three major strong women here. Although, you know, I said you know Harley isn't, but you know, nevertheless, she has strength to her, and you know, I, I believe Steve Schatz who recently asked, why do we even have a glass ceiling? Because otherwise it would rain right on our heads. The, you know, his movies have quips, humor, and that is also, like I said, the, you know, clearly the reshoots to add more jokes and such, but there was already humor, and it's, it's this dark kind of, yeah. And you know, some of the members of the squad are sadistic, cruel. You know, this isn't set in LA, but it is still this kind of dark, violent inner city with a lot of crime where problems are solved by vigilantism, you know, maybe by cops, but certainly not within the established system, not within the, the rules. You know, although I I don't know if Midway is as bad as Gotham, but yeah. And you know, these are you know his the the characters are all human, although 
some are ugly and you know but but none of them are quite flat not none of them are just pure evil you know like like i said it's not that incubus and Moon's alter ego are just evil it's that they're like they used to worship us they're supposed to worship us because we're the we're the big powerful and they are they're the big power powerful you can understand why they want to be worshipped and they're like well screw this if they're not gonna worship us if they're gonna entrap us and we've been entrapped for this long we're gonna kill them all you know and you can also understand the humans who presented you know who worshiped them for a while but then trapped them and you know there's there's some gray to any of of his characters pretty much and you know his protagonists are anti-heroes in this case we are really talking villains you know this is this is the dirty dozen with super villains and you know, this is not the first time that Ayrd uh, has done, you know, kind of military stuff, but, you know, usually, whether it's current or former military, it's this kind of PTSD, flashbacks, the, the ugliness of war, not really in this, not for the military people, the, the squad members have, you know, really bad memories and such. And... You know, for those who don't know, David Ayer spent some of his youth, some of his teen years, in the South Central Los Angeles, in this gang environment. So, yeah, since then, he's been making movies set in this kind of environment, because he understands this environment. You know, the this kind of gang environment with you know slang the the world the social environment the you know the the members and their relationships and you know the the you know why their relationships are interesting and the the hierarchy alpha males macho culture you know, and and also followers. This, like the, you know, the the other kind of gang environment movies he's made, has a kind of machoism test where someone is in kind of an environment where, yeah, you know, what what are you going to put up with? And how are you going to react to provocation? And, you know, and if hypothetically the person fails the test, something bad is going to happen. And, you know, there's this fatalism. You know, these are people who've chosen you know, living on the streets, killing people over trusting authority. I'm not, I'm not saying they necessarily had the best prospects, but nevertheless, they go with gangs rather than, you know, and this kind of snitches get stitches, hating authority rather than trusting authority. And, you know, there's actually, in, in, in training day, the... You know, it. Yeah, his his movies have these corrupt kind of cops and such. And in Training Day in two thousand one, the the you know the antagonist corrupt cop says it's not about what happened; it's about what you can prove. Then seven years later, in Street Kings, the anti-hero corrupt cop corrupt cop protagonist says it's not about what you know we're cops we can do what we want it's how we write it up you know because over the course of that time you know the the shift had started towards 
hey, maybe we shouldn't always trust cops. And yeah, you know, there's actually there's there's a corrupt cop or fed or military man or the like in every movie he's written and or directed other than maybe U571. I, I haven't watched that one and I'm not entirely sure, but every other movie, yeah, every last one of them, at least one corrupt, yeah. And, but, you know, the, part of it is, of course, that these, you know, game members, they were abused by the system. They know, maybe they're really uncomfortable with prison life, you know, tough types, gritty, witty, itty bitty, nitty. It's it's authentic, very real, this you know, his depiction of this world. Then you know, these you know, they're professionals at really dirty jobs and you know David Iyer has done movies with several really distinct characters in them, but this has more of them. They are metahumans, and they are, you know, in this case, they're forced together. They they're not really on the same side, except they're all they all agree on, you know, how much Batflex sucks. But other than that, yeah, they're not. They're they definitely don't want to serve the the cause that they've been forced to fight for. And, and this is apparently the first live action movie where the a, a team of bad guys are the leads. I'm not sure it's the first movie where like bad guys are the leads, period. But yeah. And and also like comic book adaptation, the first, where it's a team of bad guys. You know, as a as a quick example, the 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 usual suspects, you know, the, the protagonists are all criminals, so, yeah. And the, the movie definitely does go practical over CGI, but there is perhaps still too much CGI. I was not sure this movie was going to work. It introduces a lot of people, you know, very early in the DCEU, and these are much lesser known characters than Bad Flag and Superman. You know, some people say that, you know, going, you know, calling the first movie Man of Steel and then the second one Batman v Superman, oh, it's completely different. It's going to confuse. They're basically the same format. Man of, you know, and then you have Batman versus, you know, Dawn of Justice. So it's, it's the exact same. But, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing of, you know, can you properly tell them apart? And, you know, basically they are, they have just enough definition for that. You know, Iyer does not handle this many characters as well as Joss Whedon and the Russo brothers. But, you know, it is basically... It's, it's more or less easy to follow how they, they're fighting the, the two powerful siblings and, you know, how they... You know, how... how well they're doing, what they're trying to do, and why, and how they're approaching it. And it does have at least a few kind of significant, memorable bits of action with like standout scenes. Every single character who at all has, you know, where we have any expectation at all of them being able to Fin for themselves, or the like, gets at least one bit where they're really badass in action, using their, you know, doing what they do well, and and such. You know the 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 last third of the film is not really one long climax, but though 
although the you know like I like I said it's to an extent a different film and there's some tonal whiplash and you know you get to see them use this cool tech that the you know that that some of them have like you know the cybernetic eye the the boomerang with a camera on it and you know at least most of the characters get some kind of development or exploration and you know the the powers get used the, the powers abilities and such get used it it doesn't feel like characters really stand around without anything to do and you know i've i've talked about how the x-men movies they're always splitting up characters or disabling you know and or disabling some in this you actually do have you know not long after they crash the the squad actually stand and a bunch of avocado men come at them and yeah they all get to fight at the same time against these and it's in part because there are so many of them and because each character has the ability to take them out you know it's they're not that different from just human beings. You know, the, the reason that Rival Cattlemen is because you can't kill that many people in a PG-13 movie and not have at least some proof. Yeah, not, not on screen. And there's a lot of on screen death in this movie. And again, you know, you have, you know, Katana slicing, slicing through a skull. You have Harley bashing the you know bashing in the brains of some of these but yeah you know the enough come at them and they basically they stand in a circle back to back kind of and thus all get to fight basically at the same time and The you know, and there there are good interactions between the different characters. The you know, some of them you expect to kind of get along well, some of them not so much. And yeah, and I'm not sure. You know, something you also want to see is them maybe kind of working together, where one will do something and then another will help out and such. And I'm not sure I'd really say you get that in this, com you know, where I'd say most re most of all the recent ones have at least some where some characters are working together, using their powers and abilities together. And scenes turn, which, you know, we already knew in Ark do really well. And the action tends to be well directed. You can follow how things go the way they, the way they go. And there, you know, there is still some luck and accident helping out the, you know, Irish characters and some really convenient writing. The action gets really brutal at times. You can really feel the pain, which is quite substantial. You know, bones are broken when it's necessary to take someone out. You know, though this doesn't really have much like wounding and bleeding and such. Again, because it's PG-13, not an R. But characters do gun down, shoot right in the face and and the like when that is called for and it does do you know at times it does really well at showing us what we want as fans and you know the 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 squad don't really use their symbols, their respective symbols, to inspire 
hope and good deeds in you know the the people who see them but then you know that would make them the DC Trinity or rather the not the DCEU Trinity but yeah and in, in the comics there is a lot of bloody death you know including some on the squad itself you know stabbings shootings gore limbs bitten off blown off you know one reviewer noted of death is for suckers anyone it feels like anyone could die at any moment and I do think they they got a pretty good team composition here it's a lot of characters will have too many to keep track of and these are people who are on the team in you know the comics I listed you know or in in the case of Killer Croc you know he is a part of Batman's rogues gallery so it makes sense you know he yeah they didn't pull his name out of a hat you know and the you know, and, and even in the trailers, you do see that the isolated, repressed character who can manipulate fire, but doesn't want to and tries to, you know, does use it at least once in a really cool way. So, you know, not like that movie where Ron Perlman plays a red thing. And, you know, in the, even in the trailer, you see, you know, dead shot, you know, be like, you know, I'm touching you when when you know Diablo's like don't touch me. Neither of evidently neither of them know how to play I'm not touching you. And there's not a lot of history between the characters in this. And I already mentioned some that you know we have strong female characters. There's some of the most powerful and vital some more so than the male characters you know it's it's Doom Moon's alter ego who frees Incubus not the other way around and it you know I do think it's noteworthy that this is you know one of two movies that Ira has directed where the you know the boss who maybe sometimes breaks the rules and can be somewhat manipulative is is a black person who you know first two letters of the the name are w a then you know two consonants and ends with an e r you know wander and waller and you know david honor's endings are sometimes not all that good and yeah that's unfortunately the case here as well and I know there isn't really a scene where it could have been, but this is one of Iyer's first movies to, you know, again, the, the World War II one couldn't have had it, but where no one passes through someone else's home and something really shallow is on TV. I've read other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.